The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, so today is the last lecture day. We're going to talk about uh, the raw architecture. This is a processor that was built here at MIT and essentially trailblazed a lot of the research in terms of parallel architectures uh, for multi-cores, uh, computation for multi-cores, programming language, and so on. So you've heard some things about RAW uh, and the parallelizing technology in terms of StreamIt. I'm going to cover uh, some of that again here today just briefly and give you a little bit more insight into what went, in, when, what went into the design of the RAW architecture. So these are the RAW chips uh, that were delivered in October of 2002. Each one of these uh, has 16 processors on it. I'm going to show you a sort of a diagram on the next slide. Uh, it's really a tiled microprocessor. We'll get into what that means and how it actually, uh, what, what, is, what does a tiled pro microprocessor give you that makes it an attractive design point in the architecture space. Each of the raw tiles, you can sort of see the outline here, uh, sort of replicates, uh, is four millimeters. It's a four millimeter squared. Uh, it's a sin single issue, eight stage pipeline. It has local memory, uh, so it's a 32K cache. Um, and the unique aspect of the raw processor is that it has a lot of on-chip networks that you can use to orchestrate communication between processors. So there's two operating networks. I'm gonna get into what that means and what they're used for. Uh, but these essentially allow you to do point-to-point -point communication between tiles with very low latency. And then there's uh, a network that essentially allows you to handle cache misses and input and output, and then one for message passing, so more uh, uh, dynamic style messaging, uh, something similar to what you're accustomed to with uh, the cell, for example, in DMA transfers. Uh, this was built uh, in 180 nanometer uh, ASIC technology by IBM. It's got 100 million transistors. It was designed here by MIT grad students. Uh, it's got uh, you know, something like a million gates on it. Uh, three to four years of development times. And it was really interesting here is that this was because of the tiled nature of the architecture. Uh, you, know, you can just design one tile and then once you have one tile, you can essentially just plop down more and more and more of them. And so you have one, you scale it out to 16 tiles. The design sort of came back without any bugs when, it was, uh, when the first chip was delivered. Uh, the core frequency was uh, expected to run at 425, uh, I think uh, lower than 425 megahertz. Right, Smart? Uh, for 250. 250 megahertz and came back and uh, it ran at 425 megahertz uh, and it's been clocked as high as 500 megahertz at 2.2 volts. Uh, the chip isn't really designed for low power, uh, but the tile abstraction is really nice um, for power consumption because if you're not using tiles, you can essentially just shut them down. So it'll allow you to sort of uh, have uh, power efficient design just by nature of the architecture. Uh, but when you're using all the tiles, all the memories, all the uh, networks uh, in a non-sort of um, optimized design, you consume about 18 watts of uh, power. So what's, uh, you know, how do you use this tile processor? So here's one particular example. Uh, the nice thing about tile architecture is that you can let applications consume as many tiles as they need. Uh, you know, if you have not an application with a lot of parallelism, then you give it a lot of tiles. Uh, if you have an application that doesn't need a lot of parallelism, then you don't give it a lot of tiles. So it allows you to really exploit uh, sort of the mapping of your application uh, down to the architecture and gives you ASIC-like behavior, application-specific uh, processing technology. So you know, one example is you have some video that you're uh, recording and you want to encode it uh, and uh, you know, stream it across the web or display it on your monitor or whatever else. So you can have some logic that you map down to the chip. So here you do some computation. Uh, you have memories uh, sprinkled across the tile that you're going to use for local uh, local store. So you can do you can parallelize, for example, the motion compensate the motion estimation uh, for encoding the temporal the temporal redundancy in a video stream. Um, you can have another application completely independent running on another part of the chip. Um, and so here's an application that's using four different tiles, and it's really isolated. It doesn't affect what's going on in these tiles. Uh, you can have another application that's running something like MPI where you're doing dynamic messaging, um, an HTTPD server, and this tile is maybe not used so it's just sleeping or it's idle. Uh, you can have memories connected off the chip, uh, I.O. devices. So 
it's really interesting in, in the sense that probably the most interesting aspect of it is you just allow the tiles to sort of be used as your fundamental resource and you can scale them up as your application parallelism scales. This is a picture of the raw board, uh, the raw motherboard that's actually, you can see it in the status center in the raw lab. Uh, this is the raw chip. A lot of the peripheral device uh, firmware and uh, interconnect uh, you know, for dealing with, with a lot of devices off the, chip, off the chip are implemented in these FPGAs, so these are Xilinx chips. Uh, there's DRAM, you have connection to a PCI, PCI card, USB stick, um, a network interface so you can actually log into this machine and use it. Uh, it, it can, uh, and there's a sort of real compiler, you can run real applications on it. Um, there's actually uh, a bigger chip that we've built where we take four of these raw chips and sort of scale them up so you can have, rather than having 16 tiles on your motherboard, you can have four raw chips that gives you 64 tiles. You can scale this up to 1,000 tiles or so on. Just because of the tile nature, everything is symmetric, homogeneous, so you can really scale it up really, uh, really big. So what is the performance of raw? So looking at the uh, uh, sort of overall application performance, so we've done a lot of benchmarking. So these are from numbers from a paper that was published in 2004, where we took a lot of applications, some are well known used in standard benchmark suites, and sort of compiled them for raw using various raw compilers that we've built in-house. And we've compared them against the Pentium 3. So the Pentium 3 uh, is sort of a unique comparison point because it sort of matches raw in terms of the, uh, the technology that was used to fabricate the two. And what you're seeing here, this is a lock scale, uh, the speed up of the application running on raw uh, compared to the application running on the P3. So the higher you get, the better the, the performance is. So these applications sort of group into uh, a few classes. So the first class is what we call ILP applications. So these are applications that have essentially instruction level parallelism. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that and sort of explain it. But you've seen this early on in the lecture, uh, in, in some of Simon's lectures. So here you're trying to exploit sort of inherent instruction level parallelism in the applications. And if you have lots of ILP, then you map it to a lot of tiles. And you can get parallelism that way, and you get better performance. These applications here, uh, what we call the streaming applications. So you saw some of these in the streaming uh, lecture and the, uh, the streaming parallelizing compiler. Uh, some of those numbers were generated on a raw-like architecture. And then you have the server or sort of more traditional applications that you expect to uh, run in, in a server style or throughput oriented. Um, and then finally you have bit level applications, so doing things at the, very, at, the, at the lowest level of computation where you're doing a lot of bit manipulation. So what you're, you know, what's interesting here to note is that as you get into more applications that have a lot of inherent parallelism in them, where you want explicit, uh, sort of, where you can extract a lot of parallelism because of the explicit nature of the applications, you can really map those really well to the architecture. And because of the communication uh, nature, uh, because of the communication capabilities of the architecture, you know, be being able to stream data from one tile to another really fast, you can get really, uh, really high on-chip bandwidth, and that gives you really high performance, especially for these kinds of applications. There are other applications uh, that we've done, some of the students have worked on in the raw group. So an MPEG-2 encoder, uh, where you're essentially trying to do real-time encoding of a video stream uh, at different resolutions, so 350 by 240 or 720 by 480, uh, where you're compiling down to the number of tiles, you know, 1, 4, 8, 16, sorry, 1 and 16 or somehow missing, not sure why. And what you're looking for here is sort of uh, scalability of your algorithm. As you add more tiles, are you getting more and more performance? Or are you getting better and better throughput? So you can encode more frames per second, for example. You know, so if you're doing HDTV at uh, 1080p, then you really want to sort of get, uh, there's a lot of uh, compute power that you need. And so as you add more frames, maybe you can get to sort of the throughput that you need uh, for HDTV. And so this is something that might be interesting for some of your projects as well. And we've talked about this before, uh, you know, on the cell, as you're using more and more SPEs, can you sort of accelerate the performance of your application? Can you sort of show that if you're doing some visual aspects, and you can sort of demonstrate it. So there's a demo that is set up in, uh, in the lab where you can sort of crank up the number of tiles that you're using and you get better uh, performance from the MPEG encoder. And just looking at the number of frames per second that you can get, um, 
you know, it's with 64 tiles, so the raw chip is 16 tiles, but you can sort of scale it up by having more chips. So you can get about 51 frames. These numbers have been improved, and uh, there are different ways of uh, sort of optimizing these performances. Uh, you know, 352 uh, by, four, by 280 by 240, getting uh, you know an estimated data rate, estimated throughput of 160 frames per second almost. So just really high bandwidth. Um, another interesting thing that we've done with the raw chip is taking a look at graphics pipelines and looking at is there anything we can do to exploit sort of the inherent uh, tile architecture of the raw chip. So here's a screenshot from Counter Strike and simplified graphics pipeline where you have some input to the screen you want to render, you do some vertex shading. So these are triangles that you want to sort of figure out what colors to, to make, uh, what colors to paint them, uh, triangle setup for the pixel stage. And you know, in this screen, you'll notice that there are two different things that you're rendering. There's essentially this part of the screen which has a lot of triangles that span a relatively uh, not so complex uh, uh, image and then you have these guys here that have fewer triangles, span a smaller region of the, of, the, uh, of the frame. And what you might want to do is allocate more compute power to the pixel stage and less compute power to the vertex stage. So that's analogous to saying, I want more tiles for one stage of the pipeline and fewer tiles for another. Or maybe I want to be able to sort of dynamically change how many tiles I'm allocating at different stages of the pipeline. So that as your, as your screens that you're rendering change, in terms of their complexity, you can have, uh, you know, you can maintain sort of the good visual illusions uh, transparently without sort of compromising uh, a lot of the uh, utilization of the chip. So some demos that were done with the graphics group at, at MIT, Frederick Duran's group, um, you know, fong shading, you have 132 vertices, one light source, uh, you know, so this is what you're trying to shade. You have a lot of regions that's black. So if you're looking at a fixed pipeline where you know, the vertex shader is taking six tiles. This is on a 64 tile chip. The rasterizer is taking 15 tiles. The pixel processor has 15 tiles. The output buffer operations have 15 tiles. Then you might not sort of get the best utilization because for that entire region that you're rendering where it's black, or there's uh, nothing, to re nothing really interesting happening there, you want to shift those tiles to another processor, uh, to another stage of the pipeline. Or if you can't really utilize them, then you're just wasting power wasting energy and so you might just want to shut them down and not use them at all. So with a fixed pipeline versus a reconfigurable pipeline where I can sort of change uh, the number of tiles allocated to, to different stages of the pipeline, I can get better utilization um, and in some cases better performance. So here shorter bars uh, mean you're finishing faster in time. Um, so this is sort of indicative also of what's going on in the graphics industry. So the graphics cars used to be very uh, Sort of monolith, uh, very uh, um, un, 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 well, they had fixed resources allocated to different stage, which is essentially what we're trying to model in this uh, part of the experiment, where more and more now you have sort of unified shaders that you can use for the pixel shading and the vertex shading. So you're getting into more of that programmable aspect, precisely because you want to be able to sort of do this kind of load balancing and exploit sort of dynamisms that you see in different frames that you're trying to render. Another example, uh, you know, shadow volumes. You have four triangles, one, one light source. And, you can, and this was rendered in three passes. So, you know, pass one, pass two, pass three would essentially take the same amount of time because you're uh, doing uh, same computation uh, map to a fixed number of resources. But if I can change the number of resources that I need for different passes, so the rasterizer, for example, and the output buffer operations is really where you need a lot of power. So if you go from um, 15 tiles for each to 20 tiles for each, you get better execution time because you're able to exploit parallelism or match parallelism better to the application. And so you get 40% faster uh, in this particular case. And another interesting application, this is the largest in the world uh, microphone array. Uh, it's actually in the Guinness Book of Records. Uh, it was built in the lab. And uh, what it essentially has, each of these little boards has two microphones on it. And so what you can use this for is eavesdropping, for example. Or uh, 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 you can you know, carry this around if you want, pack it in the car and uh, do some spying. Uh, but uh, some of the more interesting demos that were, were, that were done with this uh, in a smaller scales that in a noisy room, for example, if you want to sort of hone in, let's say everybody here was speaking, uh, but for the camera, 
uh, they want to sort of record only my voice. They can have a microphone array in the back that sort of focuses on just my voice. Uh, and the way it's done is you can measure sort of the distance from the, uh, the time it takes for the sound wave through each, these different microphones. You can sort of focus in on a particular source um, of, of noise uh, and uh, be able to just highlight that. Uh, so you can, so there's this demo where it's a noisy room. I probably should have had these in here uh, in retrospect. Uh, there's a noisy uh, room, lots of people are talking, and then you turn on the microphone array and you can sort of hear that one particular source and it's a lot clearer. You can also have applications where you're tracking person in, 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 uh, in a room uh, with video as well, so you can sort of follow him around. So it's a very interesting application, and now I regret not having the, the video demo in here. Actually, should I do it? It's on the web, right? No. Okay. Uh, so a case study using the beamformer. Uh, so what's, done, what's being done in the microphone array is you're doing beamforming, so you're trying to figure out um, what are the different beams that are reaching the microphone. You want to be able to sort of uh, amplify one of them. So looking at the application written, written, written natively in C, uh, running on one gigahertz Pentium 3, uh, what is the operation throughput? So you're getting about uh, 240 megaflops. And if you go down to an optimized, uh, to an optimized same code, but running on single tile raw chip, you get about 19 megaflops. So not very good performance. But here, what you really want to do is you have a lot of parallelism. Because each of those beams that's reaching each of these microphones can be done in parallel. So you have a lot of parallelism in that application. So taking the C program, re-implementing it in Streamit that you've seen in previous lectures, uh, and not really optimizing it in terms of uh, doing a lot of the optimizations you saw uh, in, uh, in the parallelizing compiler talk, you get about 640 megaflops. So already you're beating sort of uh, uh, the C program running on a pretty fast uh, superscalar machine. And if you really optimize the Streamit code in terms of doing the fission and the fusion, the uh, uh, increasing sort of parallelism, uh, doing better load balancing automatically, you can get up to 1.4 gigaflops. So really good performance and really matching the uh, inherent parallelism to the architecture. Okay, so this is just a brief overview of the raw chip and what we've done with it in the lab. Uh, there's more in here that I've talked about. But what I'm gonna do next is sort of give you some insights as to what is the design philosophy that went to raw architecture? Sort of, uh, why, is it, uh, why was it designed the way it was? And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the raw parallelizing compiler. And I'm not, while the Streamit language and compiler also has a backend for the raw architecture, we've sort of seen that in previous lectures, so I'm not going to talk about that here. So I'm just gonna focus on the first two bullets. And you know, a few years ago when uh, sort of the, the project got started, uh, it was sort of the insight that in the, uh, the wide issue processors and sort of the design philosophy that was being followed uh, in, in industry for building wider superscalers, faster superscalers, was really going to come to a halt, uh, largely because you have scalability issues. So if you look at sort of uh, a simplified illustration of a wide issue microprocessor, you have your program counter, fetches instructions, goes into some control logic, control logic is then going to run, you're gonna read some variables from the register file, um, you know, you have a big crossbar in the middle that routes to operands to write ALUs, and then you operate on those, and then you have to send the data back uh, to the register file. Plus, you have this really big um, problem with the network. So if you're doing some computation, oh, sorry, Let's, uh, I rearrange these slides. So what you have, if you have n ALUs, then the complexity of your crossbar increases as n squared, uh, because you essentially have to have everybody talking to each other. And in terms of the number of wires that you need out of the regist file to support everybody being able to uh, sort of talk to anybody else very efficiently, the number of ports, the number of wires increases in cube. So that's a problem because you're, you can't clock all those wires fast enough. Uh, the frequency becomes sort of limited. Uh, it grows uh, even less than linearly. And this is a problem because operational routing, operand routing is global. So if I have, you know, I'm doing some operation, it's an add, the result of this add is fed to another operation, a shift, and these are gonna execute on two different ALUs. So what's going to happen? Um, I do the add operation. It's going to produce a result, but there is no direct path for this ALU to send its result to this ALU. So instead what has to happen is the operand has to travel all the way back around through the crossbar and then back uh, to this ALU. And so that's really, that's going to take a long time and not necessarily very efficient. And if you're doing this for a lot of ALU operations, 
you know, you have a lot of parallelism in your application, a lot of instruction level parallelism, and that's just creating a lot of communication, but you're not really exploiting the locality of the computation. Um, you know, if two instructions are really close together, you want to be able to just have a point-to-point -point path, for example, or a shorter path that allows you to sort of exploit where those instructions are in space. And so this was sort of the driving insight for the architecture in that you want, make, you want to make optimized routing local. So an idea is to essentially exploit this locality by distributing the ALUs. And rather than having that massive crossbar, what you want to do is have an on-chip mesh network. So rather than having one big crossbar, you have lots of smaller ones. So these become switch processors. So I can put a value from this ALU here and then have that value routed to any other ALU. Uh, maybe that just costs me more in terms of instructions that says where this, op where this operand is going. So we'll get into that. But here what this allows me to do is exploit that locality better. Same instruction chain. I can put the, AL the first operation on one ALU. I can put the other operation on the second ALU. And here, rather than putting it, for example, here, which would send the operand really far across the chip, what I want to do is recognize that there's a producer-consumer relationship here. I want to exploit that locality and have them close in space so that the routes uh, remain fairly short. And then what I can also do is sort of pipeline this network so that I can have the hardware essentially match uh, computation flow. If one ALU is producing a lot of results a lot, at a lot faster rate than, for example, this instruction can consume them, then the hardware can sort of take care, for example, of blocking uh, or stalling the, the producing processor so that it doesn't get too far ahead. It gives you a sort of a natural mechanism for regulating the flow of data on the chip. Well, this is better than sort of what we saw before because with the crossbar, you're not really getting any scalability in terms of your uh, latency to transport operands from one ALU to another. Um, whereas with the on-chip network, you know, if you've taken uh, sort of routing classes, you know that there exists an algorithm that sort of allows you to route things at least square root of n, um, where n is the number of things that are communicating on, in your network. But if you're doing locality-driven placement, then it's essentially constant time. And in a raw chip, it's in fact three cycles. So you can send one operand from one tile to another in three cycles. And we'll get into how that number comes about. So this is much better. But what it does is increase the complexity on the compiler that says, this is my computation. How do you map it efficiently so that things are clustered in space well, so that I'm not, I don't have these really long routes, routes for communication? But then we can look at what else can we distribute? Well, we have, the a, we have the register file. We can distribute that across all the ALUs. And that essentially decreases that n-cubed relationship between ALUs and register file ports to something that's uh, a lot more tractable, where it's um, one small register file per ALU. And this is better uh, in terms of scalability, but we haven't solved the entire problem. Now, we still have one global program counter. We have one global instruction fetch unit, one global control, uh, you know, unified load store queue for communicating with memory. And those all have uh, um, scalability problems. So whereas we fixed the problem with the crossbar, that becomes more scalable. We haven't really fixed the problems with the others. So what's the natural solution to do here? Well. We'll just distribute everything else. <coughs> and so you start off with uh, each ALU here now having its own program counter, its own instruction cache, its own data cache. And it has this register file ALU. And everybody, that same uh, sort of design pattern is repeated for each one of those ALUs. So now it looks like it's a lot more scalable. Right? I don't have any global wires. There's no global centralized data structure. And all of that means I can do things more, uh, I can do things faster, more efficiently. And what you start seeing here is this sort of tiled processor coming about. So all, each one of those things was exactly the same. And what was done in the raw processor is that none of those tiles was longer than you can communicate in one clock cycle. So uh, this solves essentially the wire delay problem as well. So if this is the distance that a wire, uh, that a signal can travel in one clock cycle, you sort of the tile is smaller, or it can fit within this uh, circle. So that means that you're guaranteed um, you have better scalability problems in solving sort of the issues that people are facing with wire delay. And in terms of uh, sort of the tile processor abstraction, Michael Taylor, who was a PhD student uh, in the raw group, uh, his thesis sort of identified uh, the tile processor approach and uh, 
this aspect of the tile processor approach that makes it more attractive, the sun, uh, which is the scalar operating network. And the sort of next few slides, uh, next part of the lecture is going to really focus on what that means. He sort of argues why the tile processor approach is scalable. Um, and it's scalable for the same reasons as multi-cores, and you just add more and more cores on a chip. But the, intri the, uh, the intrinsic difference between uh, sort of the multi-cores that you see today and the raw architecture is the scalar operating network. So I can ask you a few questions about this in a few slides. But really what you're getting here is the ability to sort of communicate from one processor to another very efficiently. And the way you do this on RAW is, you know, you have your instruction fetch, decode, register file, read stage. You have your ALU, uh, your uh, computation pipeline. But part of the registers in your register file, so 24 through 27, are network mapped. So what that means is, if I write, if one of the operations that I have in my uh, uh, computation <coughs> has a destination register that's 24, 25, 26, or 27, that value automatically gets sent to the output network. And if I have a value, uh, if one of my source operands is registered 24, 25, 26, 27, so ex implicitly that means get that value off the network. And so I can have, you know, add 25, uh, add into register 25, so this is one of the network map ports, some two operands. So this is a picture of uh, the raw chip. This is one tile. This is the other tile. So you sort of see the computation uh, and the, the network switch processor here. So the, the operand flows into the network and then gets transported across from one tile to the other and then gets injected into the other tile's compute network. And here this instruction has a source operand that's that register mapped operand so it knows where to get its value from and then it can do the computation. Now the interesting aspect here is that while you know, you've seen instructions like this, just a normal set of instructions. Here you also have explicit routing instructions <coughs> that are executed on the switch processor. So the switch processor here says, take the value that's coming from my processor and send it east. So it's, it, each processor can send values east, west, north, or south. So you can go to the tile above it, tile below it, tile to the left of it, or tile to the right of it. And so sending it east sends it along this wire here, and then this particular switch processor says, get a value from the west port and send it to my processor. Now you could have had here, this processor could say, this value is not for me, so I want to just pass it through to some other processor. So you can pass it from the west port to the south port or to the north port, or just pass it through laterally uh, to the other uh, east port. So this allows you to essentially just have an on-chip network and an operand, you can imagine having an operand that has a data packet um, and a header that says, I'm going to tile 10, and the switches know which way to send it. But the interesting aspect here is that the compiler actually orchestrates the communication. So you don't need that extra header that says, I'm going to tile 10. You just have to generate a schedule of how to write that data through. So we'll get into what that means for the compiler in terms of that added complexity. And so communication on multi-cores is expensive for uh, the following reasons. And this is really sort of uh, going to contrast or it's going to put uh, the scalar operating network in a slightly more perspective. <coughs> but first, uh, so how do you communicate uh, between multi-cores on the cell? Right? You have the DDMA transfers from one SPE to another. Uh, you can't really ship an operand a single value. You know, so if I write a value X and I want to send X from one SPE to another, I can't really do that very efficiently, right? And so this is essentially a contrasting thing between uh, multi-core processors that largely exists today and the raw processor. So we've, I've shown you sort of an empirical form, uh, a quantitative uh, an analytical model for <coughs> communication costs before in earlier slides. This is sort of an illustration of that concept. So if I have a processor that's talking to another, uh, you know, that value has to travel across some network and there's some transport costs associated with that. But there's also some added complexity. So there were lots of terms, if you remember, in that a really uh, big equation I've shown before. Uh, you have some, some overhead in terms of packaging the data, and you have some overhead in terms of unpacking the data. So what does that look? Well, there are two components we're going to break this down to, the send occupancy and send latency. I'm going to talk about each of those. And similarly, on the receive side, you have the receive latency 
and the receive occupancy. So bear in mind, you know, this is the lifetime of a message uh, essentially has to flow through these five components. Uh, it has to go through the occupancy stage, then there's the, receive, the send latency, the transport, receive um, latency, and receive occupancy before you can actually use it to compute on. So what are some things that you do here? Well, it's you know, things that you've done on cell for getting DNA transfers to work. Uh, you have to figure out who the destination is, uh, what is the value, maybe you have an ID associated with it, a tag, uh, things of that sort. Then you have to essentially inject that message into the network. So there's some latency associated with that. Maybe you're, uh, you know, if uh, on cell you have a DMA engine, but if you're, uh, and which essentially hides this uh, latency for you, because you can essentially just send the message to the DMA, write it into its queue, and you can essentially forget about it, unless it stalls because the DMA list is full. Um, on the receive side, you sort of have a similar thing. You have uh, to get the network to inject that value into the processor, and then you have to depackage it, demultiplex it, and put it into some form that you can actually use to operate on it. So this five tuple gives us a way of sort of characterizing the communication patterns um, on different architectures. So I can contrast, for example, raw versus a traditional microprocessor. So this is a traditional superscalar. Traditional superscalar essentially has all this uh, sophisticated uh, circuitry that allows you to essentially bypass networks. You can have an operand directly flowing to another ALU through all these uh, n, n squared wires in the crossbar and a lot of dynamic scheduling that's going on. So it really has no occupancy latency. You're not sending, uh, you're not doing any packaging of the operands. Uh, your transport cost is essentially completely hidden. Um, you have no complexity on the receive side. So it's really efficient. Uh, so this is essentially what you want to get to, uh, this kind of five tuple. But as we saw before, it's really not scalable because of the wire complexity glows. Uh, it, it's n squared and cubed. Uh, it's not good from an energy efficient point of view. Scalable multiprocessors, these on-chip multiprocessors, uh, sort of more indicative of things that you have today, have this kind of five tuple, where you have you know, about 16 cycles just to get a message out. You have uh, you know, roughly three cycles or so to transport message, so maybe this is being done through a shared cache, uh, which is uh, how a lot of architectures sort of communicate between processors today. And you have to sort of demultiplex the, the uh, message on the receive side, so that adds some latency. In raw, because you have these net memory mapped registers on the input side and the output side, you really can knock down the, uh, the send, um, uh, the uh, complexity from the send side in terms of the occupancy and the latency to zero. And you just write the value to the register, it looks like a normal register write, but uh, it just magically appears on the network. And then from one tile to another, it's one cycle to ship a value across that one link from one switch processor to the other as long as it's near, near, near neighbor. And then two cycles to sort of inject the network into the tile processor, uh, and then you're ready to use it. So in this space, where would you put cell is the question. Anybody have any ideas? What would the communication panel look like on cell? Okay, so you have to do Explicit sends and receives, so let's look at this next. So can we get rid of this stage on cell, which is essentially saying packaging up my message. And it's no, right, because you have to essentially say where that DMA transfer is going to go to, which region of memory. So you're building these control blocks. Right? And then uh, the send latency here is roughly zero, because you have the DMA processor, which allows you that kind of concurrency between communication and computation, so you can hide uh, essentially that part of um, the, the transport, uh, that part of communication cost. Your transport cost here, you have this really massive uh, bandwidth, uh, this really high bandwidth interconnect on the chip. So this makes it reasonably fast, but it's still a few, a few cycles. Uh, did you know near neighbor? Yeah, 100 cycles to go near neighbor uh, communication because you're still sort of, you, you don't have that fast mechanism of being able to send things point to point. Uh, you're putting things on the bus uh, and sort of there's some uh, complexity there. On the receive side, you have the same kind of complexity that you had on the send side. You have to know that a message is coming, uh, that can be done in different ways. And then you have to take that message 
and write it into your local store, um, which also adds um, some overhead in terms of uh, the communication costs. So, so cell would probably be uh, somewhere up here, I would imagine. Um, I didn't have a chance to get the numbers. If I do, I'll update the slide later on. Okay, so that's uh, essentially brief insight into the raw. Yeah. Mike. Where did you get those? What is the scalable processor? So these are from Michael Taylor's thesis. Um, so I believe what he's done here is just looked at some um, uh, existing microprocessors and essentially benchmark communication latency from one processor to another. Okay, so this is like going through the cache on a different one of the days. That's in fact how you, you know, a lot of these multiprocessors today have shared caches, either at L1 and more so now it's L2. So you have L1s are dedicated to different processors, but you still have to go through memory to communicate. Okay, so the raw parallelizing compiler, yeah, another question? Um, might, might want to postpone this question. So, two related questions. Um, so, so raw has, so I guess raw has pretty well optimized nearest neighbor communication. Because we know from, we know from, for example, Rent's, you know, Rent, Rent's rule, the heuristic in, in electrical engineering, about the number of wires you need for a given area, is that it's between, um, as I recall, it's roughly the minimum for a good size circuit is um, proportional to the perimeter, or roughly the square root of the area. Um, and it go, ranges from there to not, not proportional to the area, but something in between, something with a three in it. <laughs> um, like three, to the three halves power, I think, perhaps. No, so like two thirds, something like, yeah, two thirds power. So the, the area to the one half power or area to the two thirds power. Sort of that Red's rule says the number the number of wires needed is roughly roughly in that area, and so that sort of pushes that. Um, so the minimum you need is sort of nearest neighbor communication, and often um, often you need more than that. You know from the FPGA experience that um, that nearest neighbor communication is not, or at least it's it's good to have more than just nearest neighbor. And that often long wires always yeah, so, across the chip so, are in extremely high. Demand. So I'm going to actually show you an example of where uh, nearest neighbor is good, but you might also want some global mechanism for control orchestration, for example. Um, so not, not just for I mean, not necessarily just for control, but for, for broadcast for, for arbitrary for the for the computation to use, not just for the chip to use itself. Um, so okay, like wires, you know, scaling out two hops, four hops, you know, fewer and fewer wires. Yeah. So in, in fact, what you, what I think is going to happen is a lot of these chip designs are going to be hierarchical, right? You have uh, some really global type communication at uh, at the highest level, and then as you get within each one of uh, the processors, then you see things at the lowest level, something that looks like raw. So you can build sort of a hierarchy of communication stages uh, that allows you to sort of solve that problem. Um, but all of that adds complexity, right? First, you have to solve the problem of how do you parallelize for just a fixed number of cores and then figure out the communications. Once we sort of understand how to do that well with a nice programming model, then you can sort of build a hierarchy on that. On the other hand, it might make the compiler's job easier because it's not as constrained. It, it might give you a nice fallback, right? It might save you in cases where um, there are things that are hard to do. Uh, <coughs> there, there are some issues. Um, you know, the last two, the last two, the second to the last three slides. Um, we'll talk about an example of where that might be the case. So raw, I guess, being taught sort of simple and tiled, I guess one of the selling points, I think, was that it really cuts down on the engineering effort. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this was done, you know, a million right. gates in, in-house by Google so, PhD students. So a company like Intel has a ridiculous number of engineers, and to get a competitive edge, they're probably going to want to apply more. And so the question is, where might you apply more engineering to try to scoop I think that's a million dollar question that everybody is looking at. Because, uh, uh, in some sense, Intel thought they can apply more and more engineering and, and build this very complex super scalers and they will get the edge. But apparently that's not that big pan out for them. And, and so I think there's still a lot of things that in raw we didn't do. It's, it's not a custom PLSA, it's custom, it's, it's, it's ASIC process. So at in Intel, basically, they will, if you do something like that, they will put a lot of engineers doing each of these components, fine-grained tune, 
and they can get a lot more performance, uh, a lot less power, and stuff like that. So, so I do. I mean, depending on what you know, want, the size is not everything. There are a lot of other things engineers can work on. I mean, repeatability can be helpful for them. So uh, while it makes it easier to design a process, I don't think it will uh, complexity win. For because there's a lot of integrity. And the key thing is, you start something simple, and, and as you go on, people will add more and more companies. I mean, there's obviously more things to do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, part of the complexity might be going to not making all those cars exactly <coughs> so heterogeneous. <coughs> okay, so uh, raw pushes a lot of the complexity into the compiler, in that the compiler now has to do at least two things. It has to distribute the instructions. You know, you have a single program, and you have to figure out how to parallelize it across multiple cores. But not only that, because you have this scalar operating network, you have to figure out how the different cores have to talk to each other. So you have to essentially generate a schedule for the switch processors as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the raw parallelizing compiler. And this is different from the streamit parallelizing compiler, which really talks about sort of a different program uh, as an input uh, using a different language. Uh, this is work that was again done here at MIT by Walter Lee who graduated uh, two years ago, where well, you have a sequential program, you inject it into raw CC, the raw C compiler, um, and then you get fine-grained orchestrated parallel uh, execution. And what the compiler does is worry about data distribution, just like you have to do on cell, in terms of which memory goes into which local store, uh, you know, which computation uh, operates on, the raw compiler has to worry about which computation operates on which data element, and can you put that data into the right uh, caches for each of the different uh, tiles. Instruction distribution. So the way this compiler essentially gets parallelism, it's going to look at instruction level parallelism in your application, and it's going to divide that up among different cores. And then the last step is the coordination of communication uh, and control flow. So I'm just going to briefly step through each one of those. So the data distribution really has uh, essentially trying to solve the problem of locality. You have uh, two instructions. Uh, a load into R1 from some address, and then you're adding R1, you're incrementing that value. Uh, and you might write it back for later on. So where would you put these two instructions? So to exploit the locality, then you want sort of the data. If the data is here, then you want these two instructions to be on this tile. If the data is here, then you want these two instructions to be on this tile. Uh, because it doesn't help you to have the data here and the instructions here, because what do you have to do in that case? You have to send a message that says, send me this data. And then you have to wait for it to come in, and then you have to operate on it, and then maybe you have to write it back. So the compiler sort of worries about the data distribution. It applies some uh, data analysis. A lot of the things that you saw in Simon's lecture on uh, classic parallelization technology sort of figure out data dependencies, uh, and then they can figure out how to split up uh, the data across the different cores. Uh, and there was some other work done by other students in the group that sort of tried to address this problem. The instruction distribution uh, uh, is uh, perhaps uh, as complicated and, uh, and interesting. And here, what's going on is, let's say you have a basic block. So you take your sequential program, you figure out you know, which, uh, what are the different basic blocks of computation that you have. And within the basic block, you have lots of instructions. So each one of these green boxes is a particular instruction. And what you're seeing, these arrows here that connect the edges are operands that you have to exchange. So you might have uh, an, an, uh, this is an add instruction, requires a value to come in from here. Multiply, instru uh, subtract instruction requires values coming in from different areas. So how would you distribute this across a number of cores um, or across a number of tiles? So any, any ideas here? So you can look for, for example, some chains that are not uh, interconnected. So you can look for clusters that you can use and say, OK, well, I see no edges here, so maybe I can put this on one tile. And then maybe I can put some of these instructions on another tile, uh, because sort of the, the communication flow is local. So maybe one strategy might be uh, look for longest single chains so you can keep the communication flow. And then you apply a sort of uh, a Minkai algorithm, sort of come up with a number of clusters. Um, something like that does happen. And keep in mind from the lectures we talked about, uh, the parallelizing compilers, you have to worry about parallelism versus communication. So the more you distribute things, the more communication you have to get right. So here what's showing, uh, what I'm showing is sort of uh, color mapping from the original instructions in the base block 
to the same instructions, but now each color essentially represents a different cluster or essentially code that I would map to a different thread. And so blue is one thread, yellow is another, green is another, red, purple, and so on. But I have to worry about sort of communication between the different colors because they're essentially two different threads. They're going to run on two different processors uh, or two different tiles. So those uh, arrows that are highlighted in sort of uh, dark black uh, are communication edges. I have to explicitly send the operands around, right? So then I might look at the granularity. What is my communication cost? What is my computation cost? And I want to worry about load balancing. As we saw, load balancing can sort of uh, give you, um, uh, can better make use of your architecture and give you better utilization, better throughput. So you might essentially say, uh, it doesn't, it's not worthwhile sort of have these running on a different tile because there's a lot of communication going on. So maybe I want to fuse those together, keep the, local, the communication local, um, and uh, essentially eliminate costly communication. So there are different heuristics that you can apply. You can use that five tuple. Uh, uh, you can use heuristics based on the five tuple to determine when it's profitable to break things up and when it's not. And then you have to worry about placement, right? Uh, so you don't quite have this in cell in that you, know, you create these SPE threads and they can run on any SPE in the raw compiler. You can actually exploit the spatial characteristics of the chip and the point-to-point -point, uh, communication network to say, I want to put these two threads on tile one and tile two, where tile one and tile two are adjacent to each other because I have a well-defined communication pattern that I'm going to use and map to the communication uh, network on a chip uh, to get really fast, um, really low latency. So you can take each one of these colors, place it on a different tile, and now you have these wires that are going across these tiles which essentially represent communication. But now the compiler has to worry about, uh oh, I have to essentially send these on fixed routes. Uh, there's no arbitrary communication mechanism. So if there's data going from this tile to this tile it actually has to be routed through a network. And that might mean getting routed through somebody else's uh, tile. So the next stage would be communication coordination. Uh, you have to figure out which switch you need to go to, uh, you know, and what do you do to get that operand to write switch, which then gets it to the right processor. So here there's, uh, I believe the heuristic is to do dimension order uh, routing. So you send along the X dimension uh, and, and then the Y dimension. I might have those reversed. I, I don't know. I don't remember. And then finally, now you figure out your communication patterns. You figure out your instructions. Uh, you do some instruction scheduling. And what you can do here, because the communication patterns are static, you've split up the instructions. So you know when you sh need to ship data around and how. You can guarantee deadlock freedom by carefully ordering your send and receive pairs. So what you see here. Uh, you know, every time you see a, an instruction that needs to ship an operand around, there's the equivalent of a route instruction that says, you know, route east, west, north, south. There's um, an equivalent route instruction on the other processors, and that allows you to essentially um, analyze the code and say, okay, I've laid these things out carefully. I've, I've uh, sort of orchestrated my send and receive pairs so I can guarantee, for example, there are no overlapping routes or that uh, there are no deadlocks because one is trying to ship to the other while the other is also trying to ship and they both block on the shared network link. And finally you have the code representation. So this is where you package things up into uh, object files, uh, into uh, essentially things like threads and then you can compile them and run them. Now, <coughs> so that question that, that was posed earlier is, well there's one thing we haven't talked about and that's branching. You know, this is a sequential program, it, has, it executes branches now I have this loop that I've sort of split up across a number of tiles. How do I know who's going to do the branch? And if one tile is doing the branch, how does it communicate with everybody else? Or if I'm going to repeat the branch on every tile, does that mean I'm redoing too much computation on every other tile? So control coordination is actually quite an interesting aspect of, um, adds another interesting aspect to sort of the parallelization for raw. And so what you have to do is figure out, um, th there are two, two different ways you can do it. Because you have no um, mechanism for a global message on, on raw, you can't say, I've taken a branch, everybody go to this program counter. You essentially have to send either the branch result, so one tile can do the comparison, it calculates the condition, and then it has to communicate x um, to each of the different branches, uh, to each of the different tiles. Or every tile has to essentially just replicate the control flow and redo the computation. So every tile figures out what is the condition, 
what are the conditions for the branch. It, they redundantly do that computation, then they can all branch at the same time, uh, at different times. Um, so that gives you two ways of sort of doing the branching. Uh, <coughs> if each tile is sort of doing its own control flow calculation, then they can essentially branch at different times. But if they're all going to wait for the result of the compare, then essentially gives you points where you have to synchronize. Uh, you know, everybody's going to wait for the result of the branch. But the latency could be different, right? Because if I'm sending the branch condition to one tile versus another tile, and if one's closer than the other, then the branch that's closer to me, the tile that's closer to me will take that branch earlier in time. So you get sort of the effect of a global asynchronous branching in either case. Does that make sense? Okay. So, so in summary, uh, the, raw, the raw architecture is really a tile microprocessor. It incorporates uh, sort of the best elements from superscalers in terms of a really low latency communication network between tiles, uh, which really cuts down on the communication costs. And as we saw, uh, and as probably you're, you've been learning, communication is really an expensive part of parallelization uh, on existing multi-core chips. And it's also getting sort of the scalability of multi-cores uh, in terms of explicit parallelism, uh, but it also gives you implicit parallelism because the networks are pipelined and they can give you flow control. So you're trying to get to the point where you have a tile processor with a scalar operating network that allows you to sort of do communication with a very low cost. And you know, it might be the case in the future that these chips will essentially be uh, you know, more complex architectures will sit on top of these, so you'll do this, you'll do these as fundamental building blocks. And uh, it's, you know, there was uh, the 80 chip multi-core uh, from Intel, there have been rumors that that might actually be something like uh, a graphics processor that has something like a scale operating network because you can communicate uh, with a very fast, uh, with a very low latency between tiles. And in that article which came out uh, a few months ago, it was the first time I think that I had seen tiled architectures used in, in literature or in publications. So I, I think you'll sort of see more of these kinds of design patterns appear as people sort of scale out to more than two cores, four cores, eight cores, and so on, where you can still communicate reasonably well with caches. And that's all I prepared for today. Any other questions? And uh, this is a list of people who've contributed to the raw project. A lot of students is led by an This kind of gives you like a very internal view of what happened in our groups and then and kind of what how it relates to and I think there are some relationships to what you guys have been doing. Uh, but this is trying to take it to a much finer grain this to uh, whereas in cell of course the messages has to be large, you can do a lot of poster and stuff. But in, in raw we try to do it much more fine grain stuff. And when I talk about next lecture on the future we will really get some of that detail. I just show my ignorance of basic architecture but to to repeat <coughs> Don't you need long wires for the clock? There's no global clock. No global so clock. So you, you, you have this you, you have this network that seems to doesn't require so yeah, the, the it, network actually requires handshaking or it's it's uh, the way you can do is you can actually in modern processors if you look at two places, the clock is not synchronous. Mm -hmm. There's a clock jitter. So since there's no long wire, you can actually carry the clock with the data. And so in a global world, the, the, the switching here will happen out of sync switching here. But since there's no direct wire connecting these things, that's okay. So so you can deal with cloud jitter. So okay, it's good. I think this, it's not going to be clock drift along this because... Yeah, there's clock drift. I mean, one end of the process is, is, is a clock is happening uh, at the global instant time differently from the other end of the process. But since there's no one wire connect, wires also go through that. So between, it's, there's a cross drift between, so there's a clock tree distribution. And, and since the, the wires also kind of go with the tree, you can deal with that. Drift, drift meaning ticking at different rates, not just... No, uh, no I know, it's, it's basically, it's, I, I don't think it's the right word, it's, it's the, there's a skew. In, in, in the uh, edges, basically there's a clock skew going between there. So, so you don't need synchronizers between the different tiles? You just no, we don't, we don't need synchronizers because tiles are local. If, if the clock between those tiles, clock between two things that communicate are close enough that it fits within the cycle. But, but, but uh, for example, if you get a two very far away branches of a tree, and then if you try to communicate, then you have a problem. Other thing is when the, when the tree goes here, even though it's two different branches, it has a similar drift going down, so you can communicate across. So there are all these things, I mean, modern process really deal with these kind of things. There are tools uh, that you can deal with. Them. The problem occurs where if you have tried to connect, 
directive from a farther end of a branch, something that uh, uh, gets clocked there, to something that clocked at, at a very early end of the branch. If you try to connect those two, then there might be a skew might be too long that you can't uh, get it clocked properly. Okay, but the, I, was, I was just worried about this. Well, the network, but this piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the first one. The clock tree goes with yeah. the piece. Other question I had was um, in the, the, the mesh, obviously, the, the processors in the middle um, have further to get to the I.O. devices or to main memory. Um, and what, what you see happening when you get to larger and larger processors are. are put more and more local memory on a tile and well, take a hit, or are they going to add extra memory buses off of could be a combination of both, right? So in, uh, it's not just memory, I.O. devices. If you're doing I.O., then you might want to be placed as part of a chip that has uh, direct access to an I.O. device or very close. Uh, it also comes up in case of the communications uh, orchestration. So if this guy is doing the branch, then you want him essentially centrally located. So the, good, the best patterns for allocating things is essentially a cross. It's like a plus sign where the branch is in the middle. See, but there, there's no free lunch. I mean, you can make things uniform by making everybody equally bad. Okay, and, and, and a lot of times people have done that too. I say, okay, look, make it very nice, simple model. Everybody is equal, equally bad. Or you try to make advantage of closeness and stuff like that. So you can't have both ways. And so when you're trying to make the periphery very close and fast access, uh, you are doing it by basically uh, 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 making the other parts uh, to have less resources, less access. On the other hand, uh, there are a lot of people working on <coughs> technologies that might be more for pollution and things that, that for example, this thing called tree place laser. So what that does is you put a mirror on top of the uh, tile, the, with the top of the processor, and each of these all, you, you can embed a, a small uh, um, LED receiver and transmitter uh, 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 into the chip. So basically, if you want to communicate somewhere, you just bounce a laser on top of that and, and get it to the right guy. So there are a lot of these exotic things can might be able to solve this thing, technical problem. But in some case, speed of light, I don't think any engineer has figured out how to break speed of light, uh, unless, of course, people go with quantum computing and stuff like that. So, so, I mean, the key thing is you have resources, your resource limitation is how to deal with that. Getting nice uniformity has a cost. Yeah, I mean, on the slaters, there, there are groups here at MIT who are working in, on uh, optical networks in the third dimension. So you have a tile chip plus an optical network in the third dimension. It allows you to do things like broadcast much more efficiently. Okay? I guess we'll, we'll take a break here. Yep. So we'll take a small <coughs> about three minute break, and then we'll continue the rest of the time.